Hello and welcome to a discussion on the development of the gastrointestinal tract. So remember the GI tract is divided into the foregut, the midgut and the hindgut. The foregut structures will include, or structures that are derived from the foregut will include the pharynx. You look at the respiratory system. You look at the esophagus, there's the stomach, there's the liver, there's the pancreas, and there's the upper half of the duodenum. Then midgut structures include the caudal duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, then you have the cecum and the appendix, then you also have the ascending colon, then you have the proximal two-thirds of the transverse colon. Then hindgut structures will then include the distal third of the transverse colon, you have the descending colon, you have the sigmoid colon, then you have the rectum and the upper two beds of the anal canal. Right. And the parenchyma of the GI tract develops from endoderm. By parenchyma, we're referring to the functional components, which include the epithelium and the glands. Right. Then the smooth muscle and the connective tissue will all come from splanchnic mesoderm, your visceral lateral plate mesoderm. Right. If you look at the esophagus, remember, during development of the respiratory system, the lung band appears in around fourth week development as an outpouching. And you're supposed to uh, separate the developing esophagus from the trachea using a tracheoesophageal septum. Failure of separation of that will lead to a tracheoesophageal fistula, which may be associated with esophageal atresia. The fistulas will be characterized by projectile vomiting or even a distended belly if the caudal esophagus joins to the respiratory system. Esophageal atresia is as a result of failure of recanalization of the esophagus in the eighth week, and that will result in a lumen that is obliterated. Then the stomach appears as a fusiform dilatation of the foregut in the fourth week, and it rotates 90 degrees clockwise on its longitudinal axis, meaning to say the original posterior surface of the stomach is going to lie on the left, then the original anterior surface goes to the right. And the dorsal mesogastrium will then form the greater momentum of the stomach, which joins the greater curvature of the stomach to the lower border of the transverse colon, whereas the lesser momentum is derived from the ventral mesogastrium and it joins the lesser cavity of the stomach to the portal parties of the liver and the fissure for the ligamentum venosum. This lesser momentum is going to be derived from the mesoderm of the septum transversum, which of course forms that ventral mesentery. Septum transversum is simply splanchnic mesoderm, uh, which exists between the foregut and the developing heart. This uh, septum transversum will also take part in the formation of the false form ligament. It also takes part in the formation of the Kufa cells within the liver. It also takes part in the formation of um, the central tendon of the diaphragm. Remember the diaphragm will also come from the pluriperitoneal membranes, which in our development of the respiratory system, we said if they fail to close on the sides, you result, it will result in a congenital diaphragmatic hernia more common on the left uh, through the foramen of Bogdan Lake. Right? Then you also have uh, the diaphragm originating from the dorsal mesenter of the esophagus. That is in, uh, in reference to the crora, the right and the left cruise. And you also have myotomes that migrate from C3 to C5, hence that innervation from the phrenic nerve, which is also C3 to C5 uh, nerve roots in origin. Right? Then due to this rotation, Pockets of spaces form in the dorsal mesogastrium, which give rise to the lesser sac, or popularly known as the mental basa, which is why even when you look at the stomach bed in your gross anatomy, the lesser sac will be part of the stomach bed, the structures that are posterior to the stomach, right? And the spleen forms as mesodermal or mesenchymal proliferations within uh, the two leaves of the dorsal uh, mesogastrium. And in, in early development, the spleen is characterized by lobulations that are separate. And if you then look at the superior border of an adult spleen, it's going to be notched due to the presence or due to the fact that you joined lobulations in fetal life. Right. 
then the cardiac and the pyloric ends, they initially lie in the midline. But the stomach will also have a second rotation on its anteroposterior axis, which allows the stomach to assume its definitive position and shape. That rotation on its anteroposterior axis will shift the pyloric end to the right and upwards, and it also shifts the cardiac end uh, to the left and downwards. It also does two other things. It allows the ventral pancreatic bud to migrate and join the dorsal. It also allows the duodenum to be shifted or rotated towards the right and for it to assume its definitive position and shape, the C shape. Right. Then there is something known as hypertrophic pyloric stenosis, which can be congenital or even acquired. The congenital form of it will be characterized by non bilas projectile vomiting, and there's going to be hypertrophy of the circular smooth muscle, and really it can involve the longitudinal smooth muscle. Then like I said earlier on, the duodenum is both a foregut and a midgut derivative, and the junction between the foregut and midgut parts of the duodenum is where we have the hepatic bud. The hepatic bud will appear in the third week of development as an outpouching of the endoderm of this duodenum. And just like the esophagus, failure of recanalization of the duodenum in the eighth week or basically the second month will also result in duodenal atresia. Right. Duodenal atresia will be characterized by a double bubble um, on scans due to failure of um, movement of amniotic fluid uh, when you actually aspirate it and swallow it. Right. Someone may ask why we need to have obliteration, then recanalization of the lumen of the esophagus, the duodenum, and other parts of the intestine. It is simply to allow for development of specialized epithelium within those parts of the developing GI tract. Right. Then for the liver, I remember I said the liver bud appears at the end of the third week as an outpouching with a foregut, and it grows into the septum transversum, which is our splanchnic mesoderm between the developing heart and the foregut. I would say the kufa cells and the connective tissue, as well as the hematopoietic uh, organs, they're actually going to come from the septum transversum. And by the sixth week, the liver will actually assume a hematopoietic function. And by the 10th week or ninth week, if you use other older texts, it will tell you that the liver will be 10% of the body weight uh, of a developing uh, fetus. And at birth, it will be around uh, 5% of the body weight. Remember the liver is the largest internal organ with the largest organ overall, of course, being skin, right? Then during the 12th week, the liver actually assumes its production of bile from the developing hepatocytes. Remember the liver is the one that will actually produce bile, whereas the gallbladder will simply store and concentrate the bile, right? Then the liver sinusoids, they develop from the vitiline veins and the original connecting stalk um, for the liver bud, which connects to the duodenum, will form the bile duct, which when the ventral bud of the pancreas rotates, it's also going to rotate and they'll open at the major duodenal papillae together. That is the duct. Then the pancreas appears as uh, two buds. There's a ventral bud and a dorsal bud. And as we've been saying, uh, the ventral bud should rotate and join the dorsal bud and faulty rotation of the ventral bud will lead to an annular pancreas, which is associated with duodenal atresia. Right. The ventral bud will form the ansonate process and the inferior part of the head and everything else will come from the dorsal bud, which is the rest of the head and the neck, the body and the tail. Right. The pancreas will have two ducts. There's the main pancreatic duct, the duct of Wissang, which is formed from the entire duct of the ventral bud plus the posterior five sixths of the duct of the dorsal bud, right? And the anterior one sixth of the duct of the dorsal bud will actually regress. Failure of regression will lead to an accessory pancreatic uh, duct, which is also called the duct of Santorini, which when present, it will open at the minor duodenal papillae, about 1, 1.9 centimeters above the major duodenal papillae in the foregut. Right. Then 
the islets of Langhans, which is the endocrine tissue within the pancreas, it will form around the third month of development. And it's going to start insulin secretion at around the fifth month. Right. Then in 10% of uh, the population, the ducts fail to fuse and an original double system will persist uh, within your pancreas. And accessory pancreatic tissue can form um, anywhere in the gut, particularly in the ileum, the jejunum, the gastric mucosa. For the ileum, you'll be talking about Mako's diverticulum, right, which I'll talk about when I get to the mid-gut. These four guts will have uh, a unique blood supply, which will come from the celiac trunk, which is going to be a branch, an anterior visceral branch of the abdominal aorta. In the mid-gut, will get its blood supply from the superior mesenteric artery. And unlike the foregut and the hindgut, which are blind ending tubes, the midgut remains connected to the wall of the yolk sac via the vitelline duct. The cranial end of the foregut will be closed by an oropharyngeal membrane, whereas uh, the distal end of the hindgut will be closed by a cloacal membrane. The midgut rotates 270 degrees anticlockwise around the axis of the superior mesenteric artery. It's actually going to rotate 90 degrees whilst in the umbilical cord. And during the return of the large intestines, they rotate uh, 180 degrees. The herniation of the intestines is described as a physiologic herniation uh, during the sixth week of development because it's actually a normal process. Due to the appearance of the gonads, which are going to be large, as well as the growth of the liver. Remember we said it will take up almost 10% uh, of the body weight by the 10th week. The intestines will not have room to grow in the, in the body cavity. So they herniate out through the umbilicus. Then for the return, the cranial limb is the first to return and it rotates to the right. Then the caudal limb, which forms the large intestines is the last to return and it rotates to the left. And during return of the large intestines, you rotate a feather 180 degrees anticlockwise to bring the total or the sum to 270 degrees anticlockwise. Failure of return of the intestinal loops um, to the abdominal cavity will result in an omphalocele. In an omphalocele, the intestines will be covered by an amniotic membrane. Unlike gastroschisis, which is a ventral body wall defect, which is characterized by failure of the ventral body wall folds to close in the abdominal region. The intestines will herniate directly into the amniotic fluid. Remember in the thoracic region, that will be associated with an, an, ecto an ectopia cordis, which is the heart that lies on the outside. In the pelvic region, it will be associated with blood extrosophy, which is linked to epispadias. And in the most extreme form, it will be a cloacal extrosophy, right? Then atresias and stenosis can occur anywhere along the intestines and are more common in the duodenum, right? Then I talked about Mika's diverticulum, which, which is a persistent vitelline duct, uh, the proximal part of it in 2% uh, of the male population. It's going to be two inches wide. Uh, it's two feet from the ileocecal junction uh, on the anti-mesenteric board of the ileum. Uh, in two thirds of the cases, it has two types of heterotopic tissue, which is gastric tissue or pancreatic tissue, as I alluded to earlier on. Right. Then the terminal part of the hindgut uh, is going to dilate to form the cloaca. The hindgut, like I said, is the distal third of the transverse colon, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, and the upper two thirds of the of your anal canal. Right. This cloaca is endoderm and it is, it is divided by the urorectal septum into the anorectal canal posteriorly and the urogenital sinus anteriorly. The urogenital sinus would describe it with the development of the urinary system as well as the genital system. You divide into three thirds. The upper expanded third will give you the bladder. The middle part will give you the urethra, particularly the prostatic and the membranous for the male. And the lower end will be the vagina for females. The posterior uh, anorectal canal will take part in the formation of the rectum as well as the anal canal, the upper two thirds. And the urorectal septum, which intervenes between the two in adult, its tip will give rise to the perineal body, which in your pelvis anatomy you find existing between the vagina and the anal canal. Right. And uh, remember, we said that 
the foregut and the hindgut were going to be closed tubes, and the distal end of the hindgut would have a clock or membrane which would rupture in the seventh week to form the anus, which is the opening. And failure of rupture will lead to an imperforated anus, which will simply be connect, uh, corrected surgically. Right. Then failure of neural crest cells to migrate to the wall of colon will result in an aganglionic uh, megacolon or his Frank's disease. Right. That's a problem with the red uh, signaling pathways. Then you can also have fistulas developing between the rectum and the vagina or the rectum and the urethra or even a rectal anal fistula uh, from the cloaca failure of um, proper partitioning of the cloaca. Right. Then to end, there's a cecum and an appendix which originate from the midgut. The cecum appears on the antimesenteric border of the caudal limb of uh, the intestinal loop. This cecum will migrate and assume its definitive position. That is in the sixth week. That's when the cecal part appears. And on its posterior medial surface, it gives um, the appendix. However, the cecum may become tethered to the posterior surface of the liver and fail to migrate. That causes what is known as a subhepatic uh, cecum. So that's just about it. Thank you for watching.